Five Go to Billycock Hill by Enid Blyton. Julian, with his brother Dick and their young sister Anne, were kneeling on the floor in Kirin Cottage, poring over a map. Georgina, their cousin, whose home it was, and who only ever answered to the name of George, was with them, and so was Timmy. Now Timmy, a large and very happy dog, was not being exactly helpful. Seeing the four children kneeling on the floor, he imagined this was some kind of new game, gave a delighted bark, and lay down heavily on the map. Get up, idiot. We want to trace our route to Billycock Hill. What a lovely name. Is that where we're going? Yes. It's near some caves we want to see. And there's a butterfly farm not far off. A butterfly farm? Whatever's that? A farm for butterflies. Toby, a friend of ours from school, lives quite near it. They breed butterflies and moths too from eggs and sell them to collectors. Can we go and see it? Oh, yes. Toby says the men who run it are happy to show anyone round. It sounds exciting. Well, what with caves to see and a butterfly farm and Toby to visit and... Just the five together again on a sunny week's holiday. Hurrah for Whitson! When George's mother returned from shopping, they told her of their plans to go camping on Billycock Hill. Their friend Toby lived on a farm at the bottom of the hill and would lend them camping equipment and they could get all the food they needed from the farm. With the help they were getting from Toby, they didn't need to take much. Anoraks, of course, maps, torches, their swimsuits in case they found somewhere to bathe, and a few other useful odds and ends. Joan, the cook, had packed two large packets of sandwiches and cake ready for them, and two bottles of orange aid. In three minutes, everything was packed into the bicycle carriers. Timmy made sure that his biscuits and bone were packed. Then he wagged his tail and bounded round excitedly. The five were together again, and who knew what might happen? Timmy was ready for anything. The sun shone down hotly as the five sped down the road that ran alongside Kirin Bay. Timmy loped easily beside them. They chatted as they rode along, and George asked the boys what Toby was like. A bit of a joker was Dick's description. Someone who enjoyed putting caterpillars down people's necks and so on. George wasn't sure she would like him very much, but Dick reassured her that Toby was all right. A bit of an ass, that's all. They had left Kirin Bay behind and were cycling down a country lane set with hawthorn hedges each side. A little breeze got up and was very welcome indeed. They made one stop in Tenick village for an ice cream each and another stop by a stream so that Timmy could have a long refreshing drink. Away they all went again, groaning as they cycled slowly up the many hills in that part of the country and shouting with delight as they sped furiously down the other side. Julian had decided where to have their midday meal, on top of a high hill. Then they could see all the country for miles around. It really was lovely at the top of the hill. It was soft and comfortable in the springy heather, and soon they were enjoying their sandwiches, eating enormous slices of Jones fruit cake and drinking orange aid. They could see the countryside spreading out for miles around them, and Dick pointed out a funny-shaped hill and wondered if it could be Billycock Hill. After a long, hard look through his field glasses, Julian thought it probably was, with its odd-shaped top, just like an old billycock hat. After resting for another half an hour, they were once more on their way, tearing down the hill at top speed, with Timmy barking madly beside them. Really, the start of a holiday was the happiest thing in the world. Billycock Hill was soon very near. It certainly was a strange shape. It was partly heather-clad and partly sloping meadowland. Nestling down at the foot of the hill was a rambling old farm building with outhouses and stables and a big greenhouse. That must be Billycock Farm. 
We've made very good time. I hope Toby's remembered that we're coming. He promised to lend us all that we wanted for camping out. Come on, let's go into the yard. Whatever is it? Oh, it's a pigling. What a pet. Oh, look at it with Timmy. Tim can't make it out. He thinks it's a sort of dog without hair. Hello, who's this? What a dear little boy. Is he Toby's brother? That's my pig. He ran away from me. What's your pig's name? Curly, because he's got a curly tail. Is this Billy Cock Farm? Have you got a brother called Toby? Yes, Toby's over there, ratting with Binky. Right, come on. Let's go and find Toby and Binky. Perhaps Binky's another brother. Or a dog. Timmy, come here, good boy. Yes, Binky might be a dog. Dick and I will go to the barn, and you two girls stay here with Timmy. Get him, Binky. Under that sack. Oh, you fathead. You've lost him again. Hey, Toby. Oh, you've arrived. Glad to see you. But there's only two of you. I got out tents and things for four. There are four of us. Five, including Timmy. He's our dog. We've left the girls over there with him. Will yours be friendly or not? Oh, yes, so long as I introduce them. Hello, girls. It's all right. Bring your dog here. He'll be all right with Binky in half a minute. Rather doubtfully, George brought Timmy across. Timmy was a bit doubtful himself of this big collie. Toby bent down and spoke in Binky's ear, and then instructed him to shake hands with George. At once, the dog put up his paw and allowed her to shake it. Anne did the same, and then George and Toby each ordered their dog to shake paws with the other. Very politely and solemnly, the two dogs shook paws, eyeing each other cautiously. Timmy gave a sudden little whine, and then the two were tearing round the yard together, having a wonderful game. Well, that's all right then. Well, let's go and see my mother. She's got a whopping great tea. Toby's mother, Mrs Thomas, was a plump and jolly woman. She made them all very welcome. They sat down to a huge tea, and the four visitors wished they had not had such a big lunch. It was a very happy meal, and Toby was a good host. After everyone had eaten their fill, Mrs Thomas told Toby to show the five the camping gear and help them to decide where they would camp. Toby had put all the gear in a nearby barn. Two tents, a kettle, frying pan and saucepan, and a couple of rugs in case it turned cold. Toby found a hand cart, and the children piled everything into it, together with an enormous package of food Toby's mother had got ready for them. Julian and Dick began to push the cart down the path to the gate. Timmy and Binky trotted on ahead, and everyone else followed. They made their way up the hill, following a narrow sheep path. The handcart bumped and wobbled, and soon it needed four or five pairs of hands to push it. They were all panting with the effort, until at last Julian decided they needed a rest. They all sat down, glad to get their breath. Certainly the view was magnificent. Far away on the horizon were purplish hills, and in front of them stretched miles and miles of green and golden countryside. George pointed to what looked like an enormous field with great sheds in the centre. What's that just down there? That's an airfield, a bit hush-hush. Secret planes tried out and all that. I know all about it because a cousin of mine is there. He's a flight lieutenant. He comes to see us sometimes and tells me things. It's an experimental place. What's that exactly? Well, when new ideas are tried out. They deal mostly with fighter planes, I think. Don't be scared if you hear noises from the airfield, bangs and bursts. It's all to do with their experiments. I wish I could visit the airfield. I'm keen on planes. You'd better meet my cousin then. I should like to meet him. We'd better get on now. We won't get much higher. 
George and Anne went on ahead to find a good camping site. But it was Timmy who found the right place. He ran on ahead feeling thirsty. So when he heard the sound of running water, he ran to it at once. From under a jutting rock gushed a little spring. It rippled down a rocky shelf and lost itself in a mass of lush greenery below. George called to Julian to come and see. Everyone agreed it was a fine place, a fine view, plenty of springy heather to camp on and water laid on quite near. Soon all the gear was taken from the handcart and Anne unpacked the food parcel. Wondering where would be the coolest place for a larder, she went over to the rock from which gushed the crystal clear spring water and discovered a small cave hollowed out of the rock below the spring. <laughs> Just like you, Anne. We'd better put a towel by the spring. We'll get soaked every time we want any food. Uh, tell Timmy he's not to poke his head into my larder. Oh, now he's all wet. Timmy, go and shake yourself somewhere else. I'd better go. See you tomorrow. Come on, Binky. Thanks for everything, Toby. So long. Come on, let's settle in. This is the best camp we've ever had. What's the time? Good gracious, almost eight o'clock. Anyone feel tired? Yes, with all that cycling and pushing the cart up the hill, I can hardly move. I vote we have a simple supper, then spread our rugs over some thick heather and sleep under the sky. Sounds jolly good. Anne, if you and George get supper ready, Dick and I will prepare our heathery beds. They soon found the best place for sleeping and called to the girls to bring the supper. It was a very happy supper they had, sitting in the heather while the sun sank lower and lower in the west. They finished up everything and then went to wash in the little spring before settling down on their rugs. Soon they were all asleep. Nobody stirred until a very loud noise awakened them with a start. What's that? Oh, it's a plane. Must be from the airfield down there. I say, it's five past nine. We've slept nearly 12 hours. Well, I'm going to sleep for some more. No, you're not. It's too good a day to waste sleeping. Hey, girls, are you awake? Yes, we are. Sue's so Timmy. We'll go and wash in the spring. Then George and I will get breakfast. The sun shone down out of a blue sky. And the little breeze awoke and began to blow again. Soon they were having breakfast when Binky arrived, followed by Toby. Hello. Had a good night? I say, still having breakfast? I've been up since six. I've bought you some more food and milk. Jolly good of you. We must pay for any food we get from the farm. Well, my mother says you don't need to pay her, but I know you mean to, so I suggest you pay me each time, and I'll buy my mother a smashing present from you all at the end. Good idea. You reckon up what we owe so far, and I'll pay you. Right. I'll toss up the bill while you're clearing away. Right, here's your bill, all business-like. Thanks very much. What are you going to do today? <coughs> Who is it, Tim? Go and see. Go on, then. Oh, hello, Binky. What are you doing all the way up here? And who's your friend? It's Mr Gringle, one of the men who owns the butterfly farm. He's often up here with his neck because it's a wonderful place for butterflies. Oh, hello. Who are all these, Toby? Quite a crowd. Friends of mine, Mr. Gringle. Allow me to introduce them. Julian, Dick and Anne Curran. Their cousin, George Curran, and their dog, Timmy. Oh, pleased to meet you. Three boys and a girl. <laughs> Very nice lot, too. You don't look as if you'll leave litter about or start fires in this lovely countryside. We shouldn't dream of it. Mr. Gringle, could we see your butterfly farm, please? We would so like to. Of course, my dear boy, of course. This way, this way. 
George was feeling very pleased she'd been mistaken for a boy by Mr. Gringle, who was a peculiar figure, untidy, with glasses slipping down his nose, and his hair much too long. He led the way down the hill by a little path, so overgrown it was hardly possible to see it. Halfway down the hill, the little company heard a squealing noise, and then an excited little voice. Toby! Toby! I'm here! Can I come with you? It's Benny! And the pigling! What are you doing here? Curly runned away. You mean you wanted to find out where I'd gone? So you came after me with Curly? Curly runned away. He ran fast. You're a scoundrel, Benny. Well, tell on to us now. If Curly runs away, let him. Mm, well, shall we proceed? I say, sir, look at that butterfly. Is it rare? Oh, no, it's a meadow brown. Very common indeed. Don't they teach you anything at school? Julian, do we have any butterfly lessons? I say, Mr Gringle, what about you coming to teach us? Don't be an ass, Toby. Mr Gringle... Are there many rare butterflies about here? Oh, yes, yes. He, but not only that, there are so many of all kinds here, and it's easy to catch as many as I want for breeding purposes. Mr Gringle took a long time to get to his butterfly farm, and the children began to wish they hadn't asked to go. There was so much sidestepping to see this and that, so much examining when a specimen was caught, so much talky-talk, as Dick whispered to Anne. It was certainly a strange place. The cottage looked as if it were about to fall down any moment. But the glass houses where the butterflies were kept were in good repair, and the glass panes perfectly clean. Evidently the butterfly men thought more of their butterflies and moths than they did of themselves. Mr. Gringle told the children that his friend Mr. Brent was away for the day, so they couldn't meet him. You live here all alone with Mr. Brent? Oh, no. Old Mrs. James lives here, too, and, and sometimes her son comes to do my small repairs and to clean all the glass of the butterfly houses. Oh, there's the old lady. Look. Oh, she looks rather frightening. She's quite harmless. Our cook knows her because she often comes to us for eggs and milk. She's got no teeth at all, so she mutters and mumbles, and that makes her seem more like a witch than ever. The butterfly farm was certainly interesting, and the children wandered about the glass house watching caterpillars of all kinds and admiring the lovely specimens of butterflies. Eventually they felt they had seen enough, and Julian proposed that they leave. They thanked Mr Gringle and said goodbye to him. Out they all went, and drew in deep breaths of fresh air. And then they heard a croaking voice behind them. Get out of here! Get out! Oh. What's the matter, Mrs... Uh, Mrs James? My son doesn't like strangers here. But this place belongs to Mr Gringle, surely, and his friend. I tell you, my son doesn't like strangers here. Your son isn't even here, and it's not your business to give orders to visitors. He'll hit me. He'll twist my arm. Do go away. If he comes, he'll chase you off. He's a bad man, my son. She's mad, poor old thing. Her son's not too bad. We used to have him come to the farm to mend roofs and things. But he's not as good as he used to be. Come on, let's go. What's Mr Gringle's friend like? I don't know. I've never seen him. He's away most of the time, doing the business side, I think. What are we going to do now? Go up to our camping place and have lunch. Come with us, Toby. Thanks. I'd love to have a meal with you. It wasn't very long before they were back at their camping place. The meal was very hilarious, as Toby was in one of his silly moods and produced some idiotic jokes. His most successful one was a large imitation spider with shaky legs, which, while Anne and George had gone to get the food, he hung by a thin nylon thread to a spray on the nearby gorse bush. Dick grinned at the prospect of Anne and George seeing it, although, as he told Toby, George always said she didn't mind spiders. 
Anne didn't spot it until she was eating her strawberries and cream. Then she suddenly spied it, hanging by its thread over Georgie's head. Oh! Oh, George! Be careful! There's a monster spider just over your head! What? Is George scared of spiders? Just like a girl. I, I don't mind them at all. George, do move. It's almost on your head. It's an enormous one. Uh, uh, where is it? Oh! Now, now, Georgina. You said you didn't mind spiders. I'll remove it for you and you can go back to your place. No. No, don't touch it. Oh! That's enough, Toby. Joke's finished. A joke? A joke? You wait till I pay you back, Toby. I don't call that a joke. I call it a mean trick. You knew Anne hated spiders. Let's change the subject. What are we going to do this afternoon? I know what I'd like to do. I'd like a swim. Well, I can take you to a smashing pool just by the airfield. I've often swam there. Everyone agreed to the idea. And after clearing up the lunch things and a rest to let their lunch settle, they all set off down the hill. Toby made a quick diversion to the farm to get his swimsuit and rejoined them just as they reached the pine trees he had told them to make for. There was the pool, deep blue, cold and as smooth as glass. The five children went towards it gladly, but suddenly they came to a big notice nailed to a tree. Keep out! Danger! Crown property! Toby dismissed the notice, telling the others it didn't mean a thing. But it did, as they were very soon to find out. Julian was far from convinced that Toby was correct about ignoring the notice and said so. Dick shared Julian's view, but Toby was so insistent that at last the brothers reluctantly agreed that it was probably all right. Soon, everyone was changed into their swimsuits and dived into the pool, which was surprisingly deep. The two dogs leapt in and swam vigorously round and round. Timmy began to bark excitedly. Shut up, Timmy. Why should he? Well, someone at the airfield might hear him. You said it didn't matter us being here. Look out for yourself. <coughs> you wretch! I'll get you for that. You'll have to catch me first. I said I'd pay you back for the spider. I back old George. She'd outswim most boys. <coughs> Shut up, Binky. Stop barking. What's all this? You're trespassing on Crown property. Didn't you see the notice? We're only bathing. We're not doing any harm. Didn't you see the notice? Yes, but we couldn't see much danger here. You come on out, all of you. Well now, I see you're all kids. I thought maybe you were trippers. Trippers don't come here. Nor do sensible children. I've had trouble from you before, haven't I? Didn't you come walking round the hangars bold as brass one day? I only went to see my cousin, Flight Lieutenant Thomas. I wasn't doing any harm. Well, I shall report you to him and tell him to give you a proper ticking off. We've strict instructions to warn off anyone. Is something hush-hush going on, then? As if I'd tell you if there was. Well, we apologise for trespassing. We shan't bathe here again, I promise you. Sorry to have made you come all this way to warn us off. Well, well, that's all right. Sorry to have cut your bathing short. If that rogue of a boy here cares to ask his cousin for permission to bathe here, well, then that's OK by me. Thanks. So long. What did he want to come messing about here for, spoiling our bathe? Oh, shut up. You heard what he said about orders being orders. You'd better grow up a bit. I agree. Now let's dry ourselves and go to the farm and ask your mother if we can have some more food for the camp. Oh, here's Benny again and the pigling. What do you want, Benny? I came to find you because mother said everyone come to tea. You have got a nice mother. Come on, take my hand. The little procession made its way to the farm, 
and the pigling ran in front squealing. Timmy pricked up his ears when it squealed. He thought it must be in pain, and he was worried. Toby's mother greeted them at the door and told them she had invited them to tea because there was a visitor she thought they'd like to meet. She was right. It was Cousin Jeff. The tall, good-looking man stood up smiling. The five gazed at him, liking him very much indeed. Toby introduced them all, including Timmy, who, to Jeff's amusement, marched straight up to him and held up a paw and said, Buff! Jeff solemnly shook paws with Timmy, who promptly settled himself down at the young man's feet. Timmy's never done that before. He must like you very much. Oh, and I like dogs. This is a fine one, as smart as can be. Tell us about your job. Do you do much flying? Oh, not at the moment. I suppose you wouldn't take us up sometime, Cousin Jeff. I can't even ask. You see, the planes there are pretty special. You can't go joyriding in them. Of course we see. We wouldn't dream of bothering you. When are you going up next? Can we watch you from our camping place? Oh, yes. I'll tell you the number of my plane so that you'll know it's me if you see it circling over the hill. We'll look out for you. I don't expect you'll see us. But we'll wave anyway. Mrs Thomas called them all in for tea. Cousin Jeff talked about planes, his eyes shining with pleasure. Flying was his great love, and in listening to him, all three boys made up their minds to take it up as soon as ever they could. When the meal was over, Jeff thanked his aunt and left for the airfield. The five helped with the clearing up, and then, having collected some more food, for which they paid Toby, they were soon on their way back to their camp. On their way up the steep slope of Billycock Hill, a large butterfly sailed through the air and came to rest on a flower of a blossoming elder bush, a beautiful butterfly that none of them had ever seen before. They watched the butterfly opening and shutting its magnificent wings on the white blossom. It was Dick who suggested that they try and catch it and take it to Mr Gringle, the butterfly man. Using a thin hanky she had with her, Anne deftly caught it and put it unharmed in a little box Dick produced from the food basket. As they neared the cottage, Anne and George hesitated, and Timmy stopped too, his tail down. They had no wish to meet the witch woman again. Dick, rather impatiently, told them to wait where they were, while he and Julian went to find Mr Gringle. Dick and Julian went to the glass houses and peered through the panes, but could see nobody there. So they stood outside the tumble-down cottage and shouted Mr Gringle's name. Nobody answered but somebody pulled aside the corner of a window curtain upstairs and peeped out. The boys shouted again. The window opened, and old Mrs. Janes looked out. She mumbled that Mr. Gringle was away. Dick asked if Mr. Gringle's friend, Mr. Brent, was in. The old woman mumbled something and disappeared. They heard footsteps. A man was coming towards them small and thin, with a pinched-looking face and dark glasses. My friend Gringle is away. Oh, you're Mr Brent, then. Look, we found a rare butterfly. Mm. Oh, yes, yes, very fine. I'll buy it off you for 50 pence. Oh, you can have it for nothing. What is it? Oh, I can't say without examining it closely. Here you are. I'll tell Mr. Gringle you came. Goodbye. What a peculiar fellow. What are we to do with this money, Dick? We don't want it. Let's see if we can give it to that poor Mrs. James. Look at the door. You go away. My son's coming back. He'll hit me. All right. Look, here's 50 pence for you. Oh, you're kind. But keep away from here. My son's a bad man. Keep away. The boys rejoined the girls, and they made their way back to camp. It was another heavenly evening. But Julian eyed some clouds building up in the west and predicted rain for the following day. It was not nearly supper time, so Anne suggested they listen to some music on her portable radio. The first notes came softly from the little radio, 
and it seemed to set the countryside around to music, and the four settled down in the heather to listen. And then, cutting across the music, came another sound. It's Jeff's plane! That's his number! Wave, everybody, wave! Look! He's landing! Gosh! I do wish I had a plane to fly over the hills and far away. Oh, well, let's have supper. As they sat eating their meal, Julian glanced uneasily at the western sky and the clouds which had swallowed up the evening sun. The rain was on its way. Supper over, they all got to work, and in three quarters of an hour both tents were up. It was now almost dark, and except for Timmy, they piled into one tent to listen to the radio. Almost immediately, Timmy began to bark. George switched off at once. Somebody's coming. I wonder who it is. I think I'll take Timmy to see. Come on, Tim. Who is it? Who's there? Who is it? It's only me, Mr Brent. I've come to examine our honey traps before the rain comes. Is Mr Gringle about too? Yes. So if your dog barks again, you'll know it's only us. I'm going on to our next honey trap. I see you've got a torch. I wish I'd brought mine. Julian began to climb back up the hill to the tents, but in the darkness he missed his way. Timmy was puzzled and went to him, and tugging gently at his sleeve, he led him back to camp. Just as Julian got back, the rain started, and they all squeezed into the tent. Timmy, too. Julian told them about Mr Brent, and they agreed that it all sounded a bit odd. By now, the rain was lashing against the canvas of the tent, and the storm grew fiercer. Then Timmy began to bark again, startling everyone. He climbed over legs and knees and put his head out of the tent opening, barking loudly. Something's upsetting him. Something unusual. Well, we can't do much about it in this storm. Timmy, stop! Do you hear me? Now be quiet! Aeroplanes! Aeroplanes? In this weather, too? Whatever is going on? The little company in the tent were amazed. Why should aeroplanes take off from the airfield in the middle of a stormy night? They discussed various possibilities for a while, but couldn't think of a logical reason. Finally, Anne yawned, and everyone agreed that it was time to turn in. The boys went to their tent, and the girls snuggled down with Timmy. The five slept soundly and awoke next morning to a dismal scene of rain and dark clouds. They all had breakfast and decided, as it was not raining so hard, that they would try and find the caves and explore them. Wearing their anoraks and taking their torches, they made their way down the hill. Suddenly they came upon a wide, chalky path and decided to follow it. They rounded a corner and saw a notice. To Billycock Caves. Warning. Keep only to the roped ways. Beware of losing your way in the unroped tunnels. This sounds good. Let's see. 
What did Toby tell us about the caves? They're thousands of years old. They've got stalagmites and stalactites. Oh, I know what those are. They look like icicles hanging from the roof, while below, on the floor of the cave, other icicles seem to grow up to meet them. I simply never can remember which is which. It's easy. The stalactite icicles have to hold tight to the roof, and the stalagmite ones might someday join with the ones above them. <laughs> <laughs> I should never forget which are which now. The path they were following altered as they came near to the caves and lost its chalky look. Just in front of the entrance, the way was properly paved. Over the entrance, which was only about six feet high, was a notice board. Billycock Caves. They went right in and had to switch on their torches at once. They passed through one or two small and ordinary caves and then came to a magnificent one full of what looked like gleaming icicles. Anne caught her breath in wonder, and Julian was reminded of cathedrals he had seen. The next cave was smaller, but full of rainbow colours, and the following one was dazzling white. They came to a threefold forking of the ways. The centre one was roped, but the other two were not. Sensibly, the children followed the roped way but Timmy ran sniffing down one of the others. George called to him, but Timmy didn't come back. Blow him! Tim! Tim! Here he is! I shall put you on the lead, Timmy. weird. That whistling it got inside my head. As for the howling, well... It was horrible. I'm not going into those caves again for anything. Let's get back to camp. They walked soberly down the chalk-strewn path and made their way back to their camp. The rain had stopped now and the clouds were beginning to break. They sat in a tent for a while, discussing the caves. Then Julian dug out his field glasses and announced he was going to have a look at the airfield to see if he could spot Jeff. Gosh, there's quite a lot going on at the airfield this morning. Dozens of people there. Quite a lot of planes too. Have a look. Another plane. Where did all the others come from? We never heard them. They must have arrived when we were in the caves. I wish we could ask Toby's cousin what all the excitement is about. We could go down to the farm after lunch. Thank goodness the sun's coming out again. Let's have the news on. We may catch the weather forecast. The aeroplane stolen from Billycock Hill Airfield this morning were two valuable ones, into which have been incorporated new devices. It is possible they were stolen because of these. We regret it appears that two of our best pilots threw them away, Flight Lieutenant Jeffrey Thomas and Flight Lieutenant Ray Wells. No news has been received of either plane. Both disappeared during a storm over Billycock Hill during the night. The threatened rail strike. To think that Jeff could do a thing like that. Jeff, a traitor. We heard the planes go. Two of them. We ought to go to the police and tell them what we know. But I say, fancy Jeff doing that. I liked him so much. So did I. So did Timmy. And he hardly ever makes a mistake in anyone. What will poor Toby do? He thought the world of Jeff. Who's that? Oh, it is Toby. I've got awful news. We know. We just heard it on the radio. Oh, Toby. Fancy. Jeff. It, it wasn't Jeff. Jeff couldn't have done such a thing. He 
couldn't. You know he couldn't, don't you? I can't believe that he did. Oh, gosh, I am a sissy to go on like this. But when the military police came to our farm this morning to, to ask questions about Jeff, I, I couldn't believe my ears. I suppose no other pilots are missing. No, I ask that. It looks bad. But it's not true that Jeff's a traitor. Are you suggesting that he is? No, I'm not. Don't be an ass. I don't think he is. <coughs> Julian scrambled up and saw two military policemen facing an excited Timmy. Julian called Timmy back and the two men came up to the camp. In answer to their questions, the children told them all they could about the previous night. The policemen were particularly interested in the butterfly men and questioned Julian closely as to whether he was certain that it really was Mr. Brent he had seen. Julian agreed that it had been pretty dark, but he certainly thought it was him. The policemen decided they would pay the butterfly farm a visit, but were unsure where it was. The children offered to guide them on their way and the whole company went with the two burly men almost to the butterfly farm. The policemen thanked them and told the children to return to their camp. The children went up the hill, and although nobody was very hungry, decided that they had better have something to eat. In the middle of the meal, Timmy began to bark. Julian looked through his field glasses and saw it was Mr Gringle who was making his way up to the camp. I hoped I'd see you. I want you to look out for the cinnabar moth. It's got crimson underwings and... Yes, I know the one. Two military policemen went to your cottage to ask you some questions about last night when you were out looking at your moth traps. <laughs> but dear boy, I wasn't out at all last night. Well, I saw your friend, Mr Brent, and he said you were both out. Oh, but Mr Brent was at home with me. Well, I certainly saw Mr. Brent. I saw his butterfly net and his dark glasses. He doesn't wear dark glasses. Wait! Then who was the man who gave us 50 pence for the moth yesterday evening? About six o'clock. He said he was Mr. Brent. Oh, this is all nonsense. Mr. Brent wasn't at home at six o'clock yesterday. He was with me. We'd been out to buy some tackle. Well, this is extremely puzzling. Uh, puzzling? You're nothing but a pack of nit-witted, ill-mannered children. Mr. Gringle went off angrily, muttering to himself. The five spent most of the afternoon talking about the mystery of the man who had pretended to be Mr. Brent. Suddenly, George suggested that they should slip down to the cottage when it was dark to see if the false Mr. Brent was there. After some discussion, it was agreed that Julian and Dick would meet Toby at 11 o'clock behind the butterfly farm, while George and Anne, with Timmy, would stay at the camp. Just before six o'clock, they switched on the little radio set for the news. The children listened, holding their breath. The two aeroplanes stolen from Billycock Airfield last night, flown away by Flight Lieutenants Geoffrey Thomas and Ray Wells, have been found. Both planes crashed into the sea, and there is a chance of their being salvaged. The pilots were not found, and are presumed drowned. Nobody said anything for a little while. They were all profoundly shocked. Not only by the idea of Cousin Jeff being a traitor, but also the news that he had been drowned. They went for a walk round the hill to try and take their minds off the shock a bit. At eight o'clock they had supper, talked for a while, until at last Julian looked at his watch and decided it was time to go, promising he and Dick would try to be back at twelve. The two boys made their way to the big old oak tree at the back of the butterfly farm. After a minute or two, Toby joined them. Sorry I'm a bit late. What are your plans? There are lights in the cottage windows, and the curtains aren't pulled. We could go and peep in. Good idea. Come on, and for goodness sake, don't make a noise. Here's the kitchen window. Look, 
Mrs. James is still up. She's no witch, poor old thing. Why is she up so late? She must be waiting for someone. Yes, she might be. We'd better look out then. Let's go round to the front. Not too close to the window. Let me look. Two of them. Mr. Grengle. And the other one must be his friend, Mr. Brent. What are they doing? It looks as if they're making lists. Anyway, I think Mr. Grengle was telling the truth when he said it wasn't Mr. Brent I saw on the hillside last night. Then who was it? And why was he on the hill the night the planes were stolen? Yes, why was he? I'd like to find that phony Mr. Brent. Well, maybe we shall. Now, any other window lit? Yes, one up there. Who's there, I wonder? Perhaps it's Mrs. James's son. Well, how can we see into that room? There's a ladder over there. Give me a hand. <coughs> well, Careful. We have to be jolly quiet. There. That's it in place. I'll go up. Hold the ladder steady. And for goodness sake, keep a lookout. Ah, ah. Ah. What can you see, Julian? Shh. I'm coming down. Who was it? I'm sure it's the son. He looks at his watch as if he's expecting someone. I wonder if the man on the hillside last night is coming. I'd like to get a good look at him. Well, let's hide somewhere and wait. We'll hide in the barn over there. Pooh, what a horrible smell in here. Shh, I can hear something. There are two men standing below Will James's window. He'll be coming down. I hope to goodness they don't come in here. This was a horrible thought, but there was no chance of going anywhere else, because at that moment the front door opened and Will Janes came out. The three men went off very quietly round the cottage, and the boys shadowed them. The men began to talk, but in such low tones the boys could hear nothing. Then one man raised his voice. It was Will Janes, demanding money, telling the men he'd hidden them and helped them till the job was done. His voice rose almost to a shout. Suddenly there was the sound of a blow and a fall, then another blow and a fall, and Will Janes laughed. In a few seconds there came an anxious voice from the window of the room where Mr. Gringle and his friend were at work, asking what was happening. There was the sound of breaking glass as Will Janes threw a big stone at a nearby glass house. Will called out that he was looking for prowlers, and then, as luck would have it, his torch picked out the three crouching boys. He gave a yell. Who's this? Here they are, the kids have been trying to smash the glass. Catch them, Mr. Gringle. Uh, That's uh, right. Uh, I got two of them, you catch the third. Uh, what do you mean by coming here and smashing our glass houses? Let me go. We didn't break your glass. He did, I saw him. You oh. didn't. Let me go, Will. I'm Toby Thomas from Billycock Farm. Oh, so it's Toby Thomas, is it? Get you off. wait till I tell the police tomorrow what I caught you doing. Take uh, that one over here, Mr. Gringle. You're right. Hey. We'll, we'll chuck them in this shed and I'll lock the door. Oh. Let them cool off till tomorrow morning. Timmy! It's Timmy! Call him, kid. Oh. He'll soon make James drop you. Tim! Oh, Tim! Set us free! We'll spring at you! Ow, my ankle! Call him off! Oh, get away! <laughs> Mr. Gringle shoved Julian away, and with Mr. Brent, followed by Will Janes, retreated into the cottage. The boys were tired. Toby went off to the farm, and the brothers returned to their camp. The girls were most relieved to hear the boys and Timmy coming back. Dick told them the tale of their adventure, and how grateful they had been to see Timmy. George wondered how they could find out what Will Janes had been up to. Julian was sure he wouldn't tell them, but thought that if they were to go down to the cottage in the morning and Will Janes was out, they might persuade old Mrs. Janes to tell them a few secrets. With that thought in mind, they all turned in. 
The next morning, the five awoke late, even Timmy. After a meagre breakfast, they set off to the butterfly farm. When they came near, they slowed their steps, not wanting to run into Will Jane's. But there didn't seem to be anybody about, except poor old Mrs. Jane's trying to peg up her washing. Anne ran over to the little woman. I'll pick the things for you. Here, let me have them. Goodness, however did you get that black eye? Where is your son Will? I'm going indoors. Here, let me help you. Come on, sit down. You're the one that gave me 50 pence. Kind you are. Nobody's kind to me now. My son's cruel. He hits me. Did he give you that black eye? Yes. He wanted money. And I wasn't going to give him that 50 pence. And he hit me. And then the police came and took him away. What? The police took him? This morning, do you mean? They said he'd been thieving ducks. But it's those bad men that changed my son. He was a good son once. What men? You tell us everything. We'll help you. There were four men. And my son, he was promised money if he hid them here. They all had a secret, see? They only talked about it when they were hiding in my bedroom. But I listened and I heard. What was the secret? They were watching something, watching something out on the hills. Sometimes daytime, sometimes nighttime. Bad men they were. Don't worry anymore. What? You again? You just look out. I told the police about you when they fetched Will James this morning. They'll be after you next. We're going, Mr. Gringle. We shall be very glad to see the police, if you have really sent them after us. Quite a lot has been going on here that you don't know anything about. You've noticed nothing but your butterflies and moths. Well, anything wrong in that, you uncivil boy? Well, it would have been a good thing if you'd noticed how that fellow James knocked his poor mother about. Or maybe the police will be asking you a few questions soon about the four strangers that have been hiding up in that little bedroom. What do you mean? Men? Where from? Who? I've no idea. I wish I had. We'll leave you to worry about that. Goodbye. Come on, let's go. What did Mrs. James mean? Mumbling about four men hidden in that room. And why did they go and watch on the hillside? What for? They may have been watching the airfield, you know. Yes. Of course, that's what they were doing. Why didn't I think of that before? Julian, could it, could it possibly be anything to do with the stolen aeroplanes? It might. It certainly might. But I don't know how it ties up with Jeff Thomas and Ray Wells flying them away. That doesn't seem to fit somehow. You know, I do really believe we're on to something. Let's go down to Billy Cock Farm and see if Toby's father is about. I think we ought to tell him all we know. The others agreed, and off they went at top speed down the hill, taking the path to Billy Cock Farm. They soon came to the farmyard and told Toby they had some news which they would like to pass on to his father. Toby called his father, and Mr Thomas came hurrying over the field. Julian quickly told him the events of the last 24 hours and all that they had learned about Will Janes and the mystery men. Mr Thomas listened carefully to what Julian had to say and agreed that this could have something to do with the missing aeroplanes. He hurried indoors to the telephone and was soon telling the police all he knew. They listened in astonishment and at once saw the tremendous importance of the information the children had given. They told Mr. Thomas that they would question Will Janes at once and call Toby's father back in half an hour. That half hour was the very longest the children had ever known. When the telephone bell at last shrilled out, everyone jumped violently. Mr. Thomas ran to it, held the telephone close to his ear, nodding as he listened intently. 
The children's hearts sank as they heard him finish the conversation. I see. Well, that's very disappointing. Thank you. Yes, yes. Very worrying indeed. Goodbye. Was it Jeff who stole the plane, Dad? Was it? No. Hooray! Then nothing else matters. Oh, I knew it wasn't Jeff. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's something very worrying. What? Will James has confessed that those four men were sent to steal those two planes. Two of them were first-class pilots. Foreign, of course. The other two were thugs sent to capture Jeff and Ray. They knocked them out and dragged them away from the airfield and hid them somewhere. Then the pilots got out the two planes and flew them away. So when the planes crashed into the sea, it was the foreign pilots who were drowned, not Jeff and Ray. Yes, but here's the worrying part. The two men who captured Jeff and Ray have hidden them away, but didn't tell James where. And now I suppose the two thugs have made their escape and left Jeff and Ray to starve in some place where they may never be found. Exactly. And unless we find out where they are pretty quickly, things will go hard for them. Oh, Dad, we must find them. We must. That's what the police think. And what I think, too. But nobody knows where to look. The thing is, what's to be done now? Is there anything we can do, Mr Thomas? Well, I doubt it. The police have reports of two men driving a closed van at fast speed, and they think it might have been used to transport Jeff and Ray to some distant hiding place. Well, I must get on with my work. Where's your mother, Toby? You'd better tell her about this. She's gone shopping. She'll be back just before dinner time. I suppose Benny's gone with her. Where's Curly, his pigling? Surely he hasn't taken him too? I expect he has. Julian knew that Toby had many jobs to do on the farm. He thought that it would be good for the boy to have company that worrying morning, so he asked Toby if they could stay and help him. Toby was delighted and accepted at once. The three boys lime-washed the hen-houses, while George and Anne weeded Mrs Thomas's flower garden, happy to be doing something for that kind and generous lady. All the children worked hard that morning and had just finished their tasks when, at a quarter to one, there came the sound of a car as Mrs Thomas returned from her shopping. The five agreed they should go back to their camp and have lunch. Anne and George set off at once while Dick and Julian washed their hands under the pump in the yard. Toby had gone off to see his mother and to tell her what the police had said. Mrs Thomas was very worried, and then she heard footsteps as Dick and Julian came to say goodbye. Oh, I thought it was Benny. Where is he? Benny? Well, he was with you, wasn't he? What do you mean, Toby? I left Benny here at the farm. But, Mother, I haven't seen him all morning. Oh, Toby... What's happened to him, then? I thought you'd look after him. And I thought he'd gone with you. Dick, Julian, have you seen Benny or Curly? No. Gosh, where's he got to? He may have gone to try and find our camp. I know he wanted to. Toby, the horse pond, go there. He may have fallen in. Boys, go to your camp. He may be lost on the hillside. My little Benny. Oh, dear. Whatever shall I do? Toby raced off to the horse pond, very frightened. Dick and Julian went off hurriedly up to their camp on Billycock Hill, calling as they went. The girls were horrified when they were told about Benny. Anne went pale and cried out that they must all look for him at once. Julian told the girls to go round one side of the hill, while he and Dick went round the other and down to the butterfly farm. They all set off and soon the hill echoed to loud calls for Benny. It was two hours before Benny was found, and the five had almost given up looking. They had met together as they came round the hill, when Timmy suddenly pricked up his ears. He gave an excited little bark and trotted off down the hill. Julian suddenly realised Timmy was heading for the caves, and the children raced after him. The next minute they heard a small, tired voice calling out high and clear. Everyone yelled and leapt ahead. Benny was sitting by himself just outside the caves. Curly went in there, he told them, and pointed to the entrance. Benny protested when George picked him up to carry him home, demanding that they find Curly first. 
They reassured him that Curly would find his way back when he was tired, and the happy little band took Benny back to an overjoyed Mrs. Thomas. Mrs. Thomas cried over Benny as she took him in her arms, and then set him at the table to have his dinner. As soon as he had finished, Benny got down from his chair and announced he was going to look for Curly. His mother told him firmly he was not, and that Curly would come home when he was ready. And in an hour's time, when the five and Toby were cleaning out the duck pond, Curly did come back. Everyone gathered round him, and suddenly Julian laughed. <laughs> Someone's written something on his back, in black. Silly thing to do, but it'll wash off. Wait, I say, look, isn't that a J and a T? And below, R and W. J, T and R, W. They stand for Jeff, Thomas and Ray Wells. What does it mean? Who put those letters there? There are some more letters. Smaller and rather smudged. Hold the piglin still, Dick. The word is K's. C? The first letter might be G or C, but the third one is certainly V, and the last one is S. I'm sure it's K's, and that's where Curly went. Phew! That's where Jeff and Ray are hidden, then. Quick, where's your father, Toby? Mr. Thomas was found and was shown Curly. He agreed that it must mean that Jeff and Ray were in the caves. He told the children to go to the caves and take a ball of string with them to unwind as they searched so they could find their way back to the entrance and to take Timmy too. Meanwhile, he would telephone the police and let them know. Up the heathery hill panted the five children and Timmy. Julian carried the little pig. They came to the entrance and Julian put down the trembling little pig. George called Timmy, told him to smell the pigling, and to search when he went into the caves. Timmy knew perfectly well what tracking meant, and obediently smelt Curly thoroughly, and then put his head down to follow the scent of the pigling's footsteps. He soon picked it up, and began to run into the first cave. On he went through one cave, then another, until he came to the forking of the ways, Timmy, nose to the ground, took the left-hand, unroped way, and everyone followed, torches shining brightly. Timmy suddenly stopped in his tracking, raised his head, listened, and barked loudly. Boy! Boy, this way! Jeff! Can you hear me? Jeff! Toby! This way! Here we are! Down here! There's a hole in the floor of the tunnel! That's where they are! Down that hole! Thank God you found us! Ray's got a twisted ankle! He can't stand on it! But with your help we can get him up! There was soon a great deal of acrobatic work on the part of Jeff, Julian and Dick, but at last Jeff was up through the hole. Together they managed to pull poor Ray up, and with Timmy leading, they made their way back to the cave entrance. There they sat for a while until the two men got used to the bright June sunshine. When Ray felt better, they all set off for the farm very slowly, with the boys helping Ray to hobble along. Halfway, they met the police, who were on their way to the caves. They took Ray in hand, and the little party made better progress. They were all very thankful when at last they arrived at Billycock Farm. Mrs. Thomas had prepared a wonderful tea, in fact, a banquet, as Toby called it. It was a most hilarious tea, and everyone was sorry when the grand meal was over. Jeff and Ray now had to report to the airfield, and Mr. Thomas offered to take them in his car. The children went to see them off. It's getting awfully dull now. So many things have happened in the last few days, and now nothing will happen at all. I promise you something will happen, something grand. What? what? I shall see that you're all given a free flight in a plane as soon as possible, and I shall pilot it. Yes! yes! Me too! 
And Curly. Uh, where is Curly? I really must shake hooves with him. He's been a wonderful friend to me and Ray. Wherever is he? I, I don't know. He must have run, run away. away. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Timmy. Thanks, old boy. We couldn't have done without you either. So long, everybody. See you tomorrow. And then up in the clouds we'll go. Yeah.